Welcome to Progenesis Academy. For those who are not familiar with our webinars, you can find them all on YouTube channel, Progenesis Academy. You can also find them on our website, Progenesis Academy. Today, we have a very special guest, Dr. Amy, also known as the Egg Whisperer. Dr. Amy, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm pushing this out to all my followers so that they can follow along live as well. Awesome. I'm so super excited. I have to be honest with you. You know, um, I am a very big fan of your program and, and your educational, you know, webinars and, and uh, you know, those interviews that you do. It's such a great content. You don't see that very often, you know, among the uh, medical uh, community. What, what motivates you to do those webinars? You know, I feel like I have a message of hope that I want everyone to hear and have, even if you're not my patient. I'm one of those people that believes in positive vibes only. I'm very positive, but at the same time, I'm very practical with my patients. And I just want people to get that no matter where they live. And so I felt like this was a perfect opportunity for me to share my message with people everywhere. Awesome. And obviously you, you get patients who ask you from different countries and different continents. And how do you manage all that communication? Must be very, very uh, challenging. <laughs> no, I mean, and I feel bad because obviously I can't answer everyone's question who reaches out to me. So I'm actually developing an app, the Egg Whisper app. So it'll be a chatting platform for people to be able to reach out to me and I can have all the questions in one place. Because you can imagine if I'm getting direct messages on YouTube and Instagram and Twitter, it's just not possible for me to answer everybody and still be present for my practice. Because obviously my patients in my office always come first. The questions that I get online aren't going to be answered right away, and sometimes I can't answer them, obviously, but but I'm hoping that with the Egg Whisper app, I will be able to answer people um, as they, within 24 hours is my goal, as they have questions about fertility. Awesome. So let's talk about the Egg Whisperer. That's a exciting, a very nice uh, kind of branding, uh, you know, and, and nice name. How did you come up with that, and what, what's behind it? Yeah, I mean, it wasn't me. Um, so I had a very special patient who is now one of my closest friends in the entire world. Um, she came to me ready to have a baby and she, you know, wasn't having the luck that we had hoped for through the IVF that she had done so far. So I told her just one more try. I said, I just feel it in my bones that it's going to work this time. And it did. And, um, she ended up actually having twin boys and as a gift to me, I mean, this was years ago. She just bought me eggwhisper.com and she's like, you're my egg whisperer. And then, um, as you probably know, I started yeah. something called eggfreezingparty.com. So egg freezing parties are something that I started throwing back in 2014 to educate people about egg freezing. And at my first party, she actually attended it because she was a very close friend of mine and she wanted to support me. There was a reporter there and she whispered to the reporter and she said, that's my egg whisperer. She's an egg whisperer. And that's kind of how it all started. She lovingly, you know, gave that uh, website to me and called me her egg whisperer and it just kind of stuck. And so she said, one day you're going to do something amazing with this. I don't know what it is, but this is for you. And I basically turned it into a site where people can go to, to get their hormone levels checked and have a discussion with me about them. Yeah. And then we talk about what their priorities are and then I can guide them as well. Very interesting. So the way you practice, so beside the medical aspect, I mean, just like just the, 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 the communication channels that you have with the patients is not very Talking conventional. About them. And yeah. then we talk about what they're um, it, It's not very conventional, right? Um, so, you know, the typical physician will have a webinars once in a while, and then it's just a direct to patient communication. But you have chosen a completely different approach, which is, you know, uh, this brand of, of the Egg Whisperer. Um, and um, it, how did you make that choice to, to not be conventional? And, and the way you practice also is not very conventional. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, doctors are, we kind of started with medicine. You would go to the doctor's house. Like the doctor lived on your block. And if you had a problem, you'd go to the doctor's house. And doctors used to make house calls. Like we were, we were part of people's families and lives. And, you know, I grew up with my grandfather being, you know, one of the, one of the 
an OBGYN that delivered more babies than any other OBGYN in, in, in Iran. And then my father, the same. And so like, it's genetic. It's just part of me to not just have empathy, but to have what I call hyper empathy. It's maybe a curse, a gene defect. <laughs> I don't know, but I know that I open myself up in ways that a lot of people don't, and that's okay, but that's just something I do. So for example, if I have a patient that can't do her shots, she'll come to my house and I'll do them for her. Um, so, I mean, these are, and we have a, like everyone in my family knows like that, you know, someone's coming over and actually my kids like love to participate and it's just something special for them to see as well. And they know what mommy does and, um, I wouldn't want it any other way. And I, and I was trained by someone who actually back when cell phones weren't actually a thing, um, patients would call him and he would give out his cell phone number. And so when I started my practice, that's the first thing patients got. They got my cell phone number. They knew they could text me. They can call me. And there was no question that was off limits. And emailing was never bothersome to me. A phone call, a text, it's just for me a way to make patients feel less anxiety and make them feel like they are very important to me because they are. Every single patient in my practice is VIP, very important patient. And everyone has that status with me. Awesome. Well, this is really, um, you know, um, nice to hear that, that that's, you make so many exceptions for patients. Uh, patient expectation is a very difficult thing to manage, as you know. Um, and if you look at uh, pregnancy rates across the entire industry, so you have, you know, 50, 50 to 60% pregnancy rates in the first shots, right? So you have about half of the patient that, that don't really satisfy the need in the first shot, in the first try. How do you manage that? I like to just say it out loud. What are we gonna do if this doesn't work? Talk about those worst case scenarios up front so that when it happens to someone, it's less overwhelming. And for them to know that there's a plan, if it doesn't work, that's really nice to know up front because I think that when people don't have that guidance, they feel lost. They feel like no one cares about them. And unfortunately, I've seen situations where people, let's say, have a cycle that doesn't work and there's no follow-up. There's no post-IVF consult. So I like to, I call it, you pre-plan the plan, then you do the plan, and then you pre-plan the next plan until you're finally pregnant. And I know that some you know, fertility journeys sometimes turn into odysseys, but I feel like when you're trying to have a baby, it's a journey that's it's basically about love, right? You're, you're doing something because you want to bring this incredible love into your life and into the world. And I want people to enjoy that journey as much as possible. Of course, no one's going to enjoy like doing injections and like, you know, having ultrasounds and all that kind of stuff. That would be weird if someone's like, oh, that's fun. I really enjoy that. But I feel like using the journey or odyssey to learn as much about yourself and be as healthy as you can possibly be, really tune into your emotions. And if you're partnered, you're your partner as well. I mean, it can be a really beautiful thing for two people to go through together. They become stronger, I hope. And if you're not finding that connection, you really want to question what you're doing, why you're doing it, and make sure that you, you maybe get a second opinion so that you have the support you need throughout the whole process. Yeah. And in IVF, there are limitations, right? They, you know, there are situations where you may have a patient with advanced maternal age or PCOS or conditions that are difficult to treat, do you, did you have to say no or I can't help you to certain patients? Well, yeah. I mean, if a woman is, let's say, a certain age and she doesn't have any eggs left, like, what can I do? You know what I mean? I'm not a magician and I can't, you know, regenerate eggs when they're completely gone. And that's the hardest part, obviously, because ovarian aging is one of the the, the hardest things that we have to deal with and everyone suffers from it 100% of the time. And when you run out of eggs, you don't run out of your desire to have a baby. That desire keeps going. So I have to tell people very honestly, like your chances are, I never like to say zero, I say close to zero. And the likelihood of this working the way you want, it's probably not going to. So take time with it, you know, talk to a therapist and let's kind of just figure out like what you feel comfortable moving forward with. But for me, it's never no. It's always what else can we do to help you reach your goals? And for some people, they have like a, a stop where like they're not going to do this or they're not going to do that. And then sometimes in that moment, they say they won't. But maybe four or five years later, they're like, you know what? I'm ready now. So I know that not everyone is ready to do everything that's an option for them in the very beginning. But sometimes you learn along the way that you might need to be more open to other things. Awesome. 
in the last two years since COVID hit the, the country, um, did you have to change the way you practice medicine? Well, I'm really like, I mean, from the very beginning, I've always been doing video calls. I've always been talking to people on the phone. So, so for me, the hardest part is, as you can tell, I like to talk. I like to engage <laughs> with people. I like to teach them about their bodies. I have all sorts of stuffed animals back here. I like to show them things. And then all of a sudden I had to put a mask on my face and then like try and talk to people. And that's really, really hard. Yeah. So for me, that's how I change things. I don't do any consults with people in the office with a mask on. I just can't. I can't have meaningful conversations. So yeah. I do all my follow-up calls, uh, all my follow-ups over calls or video. And people are like, well, I want to come in and talk to you. I'm like, trust me. Like I'm working like 12 hours a day with a mask on. You know, you, it's really, you're going to have a, a better conversation if I'm yeah. able to see you or talk to you without being masked. At least that's how it is here in the Bay Area. So I see a lot of patients in the office, but they're all in treatment, doing their follicle checks or doing a procedure. But that's really how I've changed things. So I don't do any in-person consults at all. That includes new patients and phone follow, and obviously phone follow to the phone. But I think a lot of doctors are doing that as well. Yeah. So I'm not the only one, but I know some people are bringing patients in for their new patient visits, but it's just not something that I can do because I just get tired wearing a mask all day. Yeah, no, it's very true. And, and you know, among other things that have changed in the last two years is we've seen a lot of uh, consolidations in IVF. Yeah? A lot of network have started. And then the solo physicians started to kind of, uh, 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 you know, uh, disappear somehow. Like right now, yeah. there are lots of, <laughs> what do you what do you see this trend of conglomerations of IVF and versus solo IVF practitioner? What is the fu- what the future look like to you? I mean, I think the future looks like more OBGYNs practicing fertility medicine. That has to happen. I mean, there are not enough fertility doctors out there. If an OBGYN knows how to deliver a baby or do a hysterectomy or do a C section, they can be taught how to do an egg retrieval and an embryo transfer. So we have this huge amount of patients in this country right now, a small number of physicians that can serve that need. So what's happening is patients are putting, being put on wait lists for months and months, like three months to get in, and then three months to do an IVF cycle. Your IVF, IVF cycle doesn't work, and then three months to get in again. And it's like, what are we doing to people? We can't do that. So we have to train more people to do what we do. I know it's not a popular opinion, because, you know, fertility doctors, we went through school a long time to figure out an egg and sperm makes a baby. But the reality is that, you know, I think that someone who is a skilled surgeon can definitely do the procedures that we do. So that's what I think the future will will hold. I think more non-IVF trained doctors, like from the beginning, will be trained by doctors like me and other IVF doctors to do the procedures that we need so that we can serve the need in this country. And, and quite frankly, we have already started to see that trend in, in a different mm-hmm. way where there is a, a, a combination of OBGYN and a fertility specialist in the same, the same uh, organization. And we've seen it in, in few places. Uh, so this could also be another configuration where there is a mix of, of both, right? Right. Um, very good. So uh, let's talk a little bit about the, the medical, and I'm, I'm going to kind of go a little bit more technical now, um, the um, future uh, of technology in, in practicing medicine. There are, there are a lot of talks that, that, that you know, kind of uh, talk about the future of the IVF lab and how automation is going to take place and, and the ICSI and all that biopsy will be automated. Um, and the use of AI in, in the space, does, does technology have more space in the way physicians practice uh, fertility tr- treatment? Absolutely, and it has to. And it, the reason is staffing. I mean, we don't have enough humans to staff the cases that we have in the IVF lab. Even medical assistants in the office, we don't have. So the more we can use technology to serve the needs of the patients who need us, the better, I think. But at the end of the day, we can't replace the human touch. We can't replace talking and communicating to patients. Uh, Patients still want to talk to a human about their results. They do. They want to feel like someone cares about them and is they feel connected to them. And so what I'm hoping is that 
we don't use technology as an excuse not to interact with people because yeah. people still need people. Exactly. So let's take embryo transfers as a as an example, or maybe the way you decide what simulation protocol to use and how you adjust this over time. Would technology play a role there, you think? Um, I mean, as far as embryo transfer and the actual procedure, maybe. I mean, maybe I don't necessarily need a, an ultrasonographer holding a probe. I mean, I used to do the probe, have the patient hold it, and I would do the transfer. This was a long time ago. Yeah. I mean, so there, there there might be a way technology can help us with, yeah. you know, simple solutions like that. Um, as far as, what was your other question? The, Not the uh, embryo simulation transfer, protocol. But the, how you decide yeah. no I, I mean i think there's an art to that and i get really strong feel i know it sounds cheesy but i get like maybe i can automate those feelings that i have about like the patient's body size her age her previous experience and you know all the different things that are going on does she have pcos is there endometriosis and then i come up with a protocol for her i don't think ai can do that okay i have had a chance to ask another physician about this a while ago and she said that humans um are super powerful computers, AI computers, because they have seen so many cases over time and they have that judgments that maybe an algorithm cannot have. Um, but I also see a, an, op a, 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 uh, an opportunity where an algorithm can look at thousands and thousands of patients, different situation, different age group, and different history of uh, fertility and, and AMH and, and all that measurements and can predict somehow what the patient would respond based on all these elements. Sometimes, you know, humans are good at, um, at making some judgments, but also sometimes uh, picking up patterns. The computer does bid the, the human in some occasions. That, uh, Nabil, I don't know if you know, my first name is Amy, and the first two letters are AI. Yes. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Very good. So um, we um, are close uh, to wrapping up this interesting uh, interview with you, and I appreciate that. Really? I was having so much fun. <laughs> well, I really enjoyed it. Uh, let me say first, thank you so much for taking the time to go. You literally just had a, a procedure, and, and you literally. were kind of uh, uh, trying to make this interview happen, and I, I really kind of appreciate that. Um, but but I wanted to talk to you about, uh, you know, how do you practice medicine and, and for patients who wanted to seek uh, your advice or, or your treatment, how they can find you? Yeah, I mean, I'm easy to find. My website is draimee.org. And you don't necessarily have to be my patient to see me as a patient. What I mean by that is I have a class on Teachable. It's eggwhisperschool.com. So I run IVF classes, Tushy Method classes, which are classes to teach you about your fertility. And then I obviously see patients as well, but I can provide guidance and you can take what I share with you and apply it to what you're doing, no matter where you live. So I hope anyone who is watching this just feels like they can reach out anytime and take advantage of some of the opportunities that, that, that you have if you want to you know, hear from me about your case. Awesome. Well, uh, Dr. Amy, I really appreciate your time. Uh, I wish you, we did have another opportunity to talk yeah. about other topics in the future. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. Thank you for your time and have a great, great weekend. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.